guys are talking. Brush two, 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 two guys. Two guys are talking. Brush two guys are talking. Brush two, two guys are guys are talking. Brush, 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 two guys. And now, get ready for the Two Guys Talking Rush podcast with your hosts, John Kane and Dan Buxman. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of Two Guys Talking Rush, show number four. Mm-hmm. My name is John Kane, and I'm here with the delightful Dan Buxman, and we're here to serve you a nice uh, peeping helping of Rush. Right, Dan? Oh, yeah. And uh, today we have a very, very special episode uh, because we feel as fans that it is not enough just to talk about the music itself. It is not enough uh, just to talk about stuff like that. We want to explore uh, certain aspects of Rush fandom uh, that are maybe a little less known uh, that maybe people don't talk about as well. So today we have chosen as our topic, the quite thorny issue of rush and women. And we'll just stay silent after that. We won't even. Yeah. We're just going to let that sit folks. Let that, let that sit. Um, And it's, 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 uh, it's exciting to tackle new rush territories yeah territories nice sorry (laughs) i see what Um, you did there (laughs) uh, but uh it's important stuff and that's what's different about this show yes we could song by song pick apart lyrics and uh compositions which we will do inevitably when we run out of ideas but you know here we are uh, over the past 10 years and maybe even a little bit more rush has have risen and transcended beyond popular culture where I never thought my favorite cult band would have ever gone. I always thought Rush were my own. Uh, I loved when people said they hated them. It didn't offend me at all. It it was more Rush for me, more Rush in my plate uh, for me to feast on. Um, But of course, you know, they end up uh, in animated series and they end up on sitcoms and I don't think a sitcom, but uh, or reference to the sitcom in a movie. And there you go. Um, So I think with that said, we are uh, somewhat intermittently focusing on uh, topics where Rush has affected the popular culture ethos yeah. in some way. You know, one thing you were saying about them being a cult band is yeah. it's at some, that was true for a very long time. Like they, yeah. they were a very specific thing yep. for specific fans. At some point, they went mainstream, yep. and they're. You know, like you were saying, like they're in cartoons, they're on sitcoms, that sort of right, thing. Right. They, they've become like sort of more a part of everything. When yes. Really, that was not the case for a very long time. Yep. Uh, part of that process of going mainstream was, you know, more women showing up to the shows. This is true. Because uh, Rush, you know, Rush really had this reputation as like all men, only yep. men in the entire stadium. You will not see a single woman in there. Right. That's not true. Yeah, uh, it is but, not true. I want. I once brought a woman to a rush show. In fact, so I know there was at least one. She's not talking. She's still not talking to you. As- no, no uh, she's. She talked to me. It okay. happened. <laughs> so, yeah. um, no, but I mean, she was your. Pri- she was your prisoner, is what you're saying, right? Is, <laughs> her arm. Her arms were crossed a lot of the time. You know, which- that means something. I will say that because I tried so hard to get my wife to see Rush, and she actually wishes she did, uh, but I could not get her to go. And I, I always had great seats, you know. But uh, her I, loss. Well, I, th- I think the sort of like uh, raw enthusiasm that yeah. comes off of us, yeah, when we talk about them, and yeah. you know that we want to bring our wives and our girlfriends to, and that yeah. sort of thing, the level of enthusiasm can be a little much. Yes. I think for the other person, and maybe they're sort of a little taken aback by that or something like that but if uh, we want to dispel the notion that this is just a dude band and uh i just i know too many women who love them uh and you know uh, the people we're going to have on the panel in a little bit 
uh, to look, we cannot let that go on. We must this is dispel the, this, this myth. This is the this is the show that 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 parts the the sea. It it it, it puts yes. the crack in the earth and it opens up and enlightens exactly. everybody. Yeah. It's it's the pulp fiction, the the briefcase. You open it up. Uh, it, there it is. It's the glowing knowledge. Uh, uh, it'll end all the end all myths of myths, right? So before before we get into that this awesome panel, I just want to do our typical rundown and say some yeah. thank yous. Um, well, this is show. We made it to show number four. As we said in the very beginning, the only way the show would end is if someone grew an ego and you know dan's already left the show and come back i had to convince him and then i'm thinking about leaving the show too because i just I, I think i'm bigger than this um but uh i'm gonna just stay stick around for a little bit anyway just joking up uh, so this is show number four no egos uh all rush for uh our dedicated rush fans we love you so much rush rules um i want to thank uh, robert scoville for an awesome show last week for a behind the scenes look at uh rush production in particular rush uh front of house and we're gonna have more in that series uh coming up in the weeks ahead where we talk about different aspects of rush production from video of course rush are famous for that very early on pioneers in uh, uh the aesthetic of video in live production uh, just overall live production for rush is something special so we really want to examine these things uh so if you want to learn more about robert's work uh, www.robertscoville.com um also, uh, you can hear our podcast on TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Simplecast, and now it's official. iHeartRadio has accepted our podcast, and you know, little do they know, we're doing this out of our mother's basements. You know, we're yeah. just a couple. We, we live with our moms. You know, that's. I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, yes, I did, I'm glad that iHeart uh, jumped on board. Uh, yeah. That's big. So uh, a big rush uh, shout out to Rush Radio uh, uh, in the uh, tune in app, uh, rushradio.org. No money being made there, just all rush 24 seven. I love Rush Radio. And um, on Rush Radio, they play a lot of Why Why Not and Why Why Not is a kind of a rush tribute band but with originals i don't know how to really um label them but they'll be on the show eventually and their music is in the intro of our awesome intro that we get a lot of comments on um and um the podcast is doing really well i've, I've gotten a lot of feedback from fans um questions from fans on the show uh please uh email us uh we want to hear what you have to say uh we want to hear your complaints i love a good complaint uh, but I also love good feedback too, and I know Dan is the same. So you can go to yeah. two guys, two guys talking rush at gmail dot com, or find us at www two guys talking rush dot com. That's our website. Um, so I go ahead, Dan. Are you going to say something? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's important to stress. I think that you know, as much as we do plan this out and do you know spend our time choosing how we're going to do each show, to a large extent, we're also kind of making this up as we go. Yes. So any any feedback that you have out there, uh, we're happy to hear it, uh, you know, because maybe you're thinking of something that we didn't think of uh, that could improve the show somehow. Yes, uh, uh, definitely. But it, yeah. but it should be constructive feedback because... Yeah, know. don't harass us, folks. We love yeah, we you. Don't, this is for we you. We don't need that. Yeah, There's no exactly. paycheck. No one's getting a paycheck here, folks, right. unless yeah. you want to send us. But, uh, you know, typically I do a day, in, a day in Rush history, but there really wasn't much going on today in, in Rush history. <laughs> you know, Getty ate a piece of toast. I don't know. What do you want me to say? <laughs> um, uh, there's a couple shows. 2004, Rush played Ford Pavilion and uh, Montage Mountain in Scranton, Pennsylvania. I'm probably saying that incorrectly. On the 30th anniversary tour. And they played White River Amphitheater in 2010 in Seattle, Washington on the Time Machine tour, which was an amazing tour. Um, so we did actually hear from a fan this week. His name's Tony. I'm not going to release his last name. Tony's a great guy. Uh, he says, hey, guys, stumbled upon your podcast. Enjoyed it. But one thing about old Rush fans is we know a lot about the band already. So I encourage you to dig deep and find the tasty nuggets. Oh, I know what he means by the tasty nuggets. We know what you're doing there, oh, yeah. Tony. Oh, yeah. what, one question I have is, um, is not, has not been answered by anyone. What is Getty saying in the background at the 8 minute 55 second mark of camera eye? Sounds like, hello, Gov, but have never seen the confirmation well this is interesting so i dug deeper because that that was always in i love the camera eye. some people don't uh dan you love the camera i dislike camera eye. uh I, for you. I 
I think of all the tracks on uh, Moving Pictures, it's yeah. number seven for yep. me. But okay. but it, it's still fantastic. I mean, you know, yeah. the worst the worst song on Moving Pictures would be still the best song on anyone else's album. It's so it's true. A great, it's a great tune. It's just I I mean, there's Y Y Z. There's Tom Sawyer. Know. You know, those those are tough to beat. But yeah, that's uh, true. I, I don't skip it when I listen yeah. to the album. You know. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I happen to, well, of course, I happen to, I love that song, and um, I, um, I think we should do that, rate, rate the, uh, the rate uh, oh, uh, moving pictures uh, songs. Uh, we got to get uh, Popov uh, back on for that. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in, so some particulars about this song. Um, the song highlights the cultural differences between the cities of New York and London. At 10 minutes, 56 seconds, this is the last song Rush recorded that was over 10 minutes long. Wow. Uh, it's a number one fan requested song for Rush to perform live. And they did do that uh, intermittently on the last two tours, I believe. At 8.56, into the song, in the background, you can hear what, hap what appears to be Getty burp and say, oh, God, that's a myth. I didn't hear that in the vocal track. Most... Rush fans believe this is an English greeting, something like, hello, morning, governor. Hello, morning, governor. Um, another possibility is that, they're, that he's saying more dub, requesting a monitor adjustment in the headphones. You know, the way to break this myth is to just give Getty a call, which we're not going to do now because I don't have his number. Uh, Dream Theater played this song at their, the entire song at their Toronto, Canada shows, and there's some great YouTube footage of Dream Theater doing it. I mean, Dream Theater just... Uh, a great band. So we're going to have a, a quick listen, uh, if that's okay with you, Dan. Oh, of course. You need to every city streets. Hello. You want golf? I'll do it one more time. Okay, Dan, what are you thinking? Uh, I for sure heard hello, and I for sure heard gov. I don't know what that was in between hello and gov, but that was absolutely gov as far as I could tell. Yeah, um, speculation is Getty Lee trying to portray a Londoner's accent, saying hello, all right, morning, governor, something like that, thereby establishing. Yeah. Thereby establishing a street ambiance, uh, reinforcing the hustle and bustle of London during the segment of Camera Eye. So, you know, my man, um, uh, uh, Tony, who emailed, I don't know if that clarifies things for you, but there's a great isolated uh, vocal track on YouTube that uh, you can kind of get into a YouTube wormhole with. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, I, I, love I love that song so much. Um, the last time Rush performed this song was on July 27th, 2015 at U.S. Airways Center, Phoenix, Arizona. Twelfth song of a set uh, of set two, uh, it was played 11 times on that tour, um, which was uh, alternated between Natural Science, another mega song. Oh my God. That's what's better, you know, Natural Science or Camera. I would have to say Natural Science is probably my favorite of the I, two. I prefer Natural Science. Yeah, but yeah. I, but I, I like mean, both. again, it's like, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a dilemma. If ever both, there was one. Yeah. I know. Both give me, both songs give me tingles. Oh, know, hell yeah. Middle-aged man tingles, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, and as you know, the R40 tour, this was the final tour by, by Rush uh, that commemorated um, the 40th anniversary of Neil joining the band in July of 74. There's a lot of little um, Easter eggs this week. I mean, we, Getty just celebrated a birthday, right? Mm -hmm. 67 yep. years old. Happy birthday, Getty. We, we love you. And... Um, you know, uh, uh, Neil, of course, passing, and, and we feel really sad about that. Uh, but July '74, he joins he joins the band, so we're close to these kind of milestones. So we have a, an amazing show, and uh, we want to, as we said, debunk these myths uh, to help us better understand and clarify the the theme, uh, Excuse me, the woman rush fan quandary, and um, we have a wonderful uh, and uh, diverse panel as we all, always offer you on, on uh, Two Guys Talking Rush. Uh, first off, and sadly, uh, this panelist can only join us for a short 
period of time she's on a uh, a deadline with her book is Annie Zaleski and Annie is a Cleveland Ohio and some people might recognize Annie's name uh, she's a Cleveland Ohio based freelance writer editor journalist and marketing consultant uh, slash strategist a 2002 Harvard grad she's been writing professionally since 1999 her work has appeared in dozens of print publications, including Rolling Stone, Spin, Billboard, Alternative Press, The Village Voice, Los Angeles Times, Cleveland Plain Dealer, New York Journal News, Boston Herald. And online publications include Vulture, Wandering Sound, E-Music, The AV Club, Amazon.com, Salon, and Billboard.com. Pretty good resume there. Oh, yeah. uh, she's, she's a regular guest on various radio stations such as NPR, the CBC, Sirius XM Canada, and NPR. She's also been a talking head in the 2005 movie Punk's Not Dead and in a 2014 Ovation TV special on the band Blondie. Uh, I'm glad that she's on and, and I know she had to fit this in but uh, she wrote an article in 2015 called I am woman I am a woman and I love Rush per parenthetical and I'm not alone. Subtitle Rush is a dude's band m that's the stereotype but the the band's sincerity loop has a wider appeal and we're going to talk to um uh, zaleski about her article what drove her to write that article uh but uh uh to pull in uh, kind of wrap up that article what that article is about zaleski concludes that discussing rush with my female friends underscores that many of the reasons they like the band are no different than why so many men like rush musical taste transcends gender saying a genre movement or musical group appeals only to one narrow type belittles the subjective experience of finding joy and fulfillment so that's interesting uh donna helpers on the show um i'll, I'll go through this as quick as possible helper is a boston-based historian and radio consultant um, beginning in 1968, she worked as a radio DJ, and disc jockey, and f um, music director, and is credited with discovering the progressive rock band Rush while at WMMS in Cleveland in 1974. We love Donna. She's also a uh, scholar on women's studies, women in media studies. She's a perfect uh, guest to relate to this topic and hear what she has to say. Uh, we have super fan Kelly D on the show. Um, Kelly uh, has been a Rush super fan since the age of 18. Many of the newer Rush fans might know her. She showed up in a lot of the later DVDs um, and that footage, that B-roll. Uh, she saw her first show in 2007 and was able to see Rush live more than 70 times. Wow. Including their induction <laughs> performance, <laughs> including their induction performance at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Rush's ethos has been a guiding force in her life, inspiring her to follow her dreams and pursue greatness in all aspects of her life. She lives in Western Massachusetts, where until recently she was a publicist for bands and musicians. She's also an artist and photographer. Um, we have uh, also superfan and uh, Rush Con director Elizabeth Eddie Maxwell on the show today. Um, she's the managing director, events manager um, uh, for. Uh, the amazing Rush Con, which I've never been to. So I'm looking forward uh, to that. Um, well, let's, uh, let's uh, introduce our, our panel, panelists into the, into the podcast, and uh, we look forward to discussing the women of Rush. Since you're on a deadline, Annie, and thank you for joining us, um, I wanted to, in particular, talk to you about your 2015 article, I Am a Woman and I Love Rush, parenthetical, I Am Not Alone, Rush is a Dudes Band, M, that's, that's the stereotype, but the band's, quote, sincerity loop has a wider appeal. Tell me what inspired you to write this article. You know, it's been a while, but it was probably, I was probably mad about something because probably someone was online shooting their mouth off <laughs> saying, mm -hmm. you know, only, you know, men like Rush. And that is always just made me so angry. I actually, this happened to me a couple, like last week, someone else was kind of making some snarky joke on it. And I had to like jump in, you know, the band got this reputation of being a dude's band and they couldn't shake that and it just yeah. it's always made me just so angry and I think you know and, and what I ended up doing was polling some of my friends and I found I had so many women friends 
who love Rush. And it was so gratifying because it was, you know, they were kind of like relieved almost to kind of talk about it. Like, of course I love Rush. You know, they're so meaningful to me. But, you know, the voices hadn't really been heard. You know, people hadn't really, you know, people just assumed, you know, they did it. And, you know, and having seen them live too, you know, you go to, when you went to a Rush show, it wasn't all dudes. I mean, there were absolutely women there all the time. Right. Why, yeah. why, do, you, why do you think the, the myth that it's really only dudes. Like, why do you why do you feel like that's persisted to this day? Uh, you know, even though there's evidence that that's not the case, it just it will not die. That that talking point. This is a dudes band forever. Why do you think that is? You know, it's it's a complicated thing. Part of it, I think, is that when when a band gets a reputation when they first start out no matter you know what it is whether we're talking my, the book i'm working on is on duran duran and they got a reputation very early on as being all about you know style over substance um and uh, you know when so when rush came out in the 70s you know just the the music and and because i mean backing up the 1970s the music scene was so dominated by men i mean you look at classic rock and what we now know is classic rock there were so few women out in the spotlight that rush kind of, you know, so that was kind of, you know, one part of it, um, uh, you know, but then it just, so they just got this reputation. And I think because their music, you know, there was a, an incorrect stereotype that because they were so guitar heavy and keyboard heavy and, you know, with their lyrics, that they only appealed to men as if women couldn't like those things. So, you know, some of that, that just kind of stuck. And part of it is just people not wanting to go deeper. You know, a lot of times with music, it's just easier to, you know, think something about a band rather than having something, you know, challenge what you think or, you know, confronting evidence and finding something to the contrary. Right. Um, you know, so I, I think, you know, well into the 80s, I think, you know, uh, you know, I don't think it was ever probably true that only men like Rush in the 70s, but just, you know, I think it was just, that, that just kind of, uh, you know, it kind of stuck. Yeah. I think uh, also that the 70s was a period of transition in society. And I mean, forgive me for doing the professor thing here, but I mean, I teach media history. Um, when I was on the radio in the 70s, radio was still grappling, let's be honest, with racism and sexism, okay? The vast majority of the program directors were white men. The vast majority of the DJs were white men. Nothing wrong with being a white man. I'm not dissing white men. I'm just saying that by and large, if you were looking for somebody that looked like you and you were female or if you were a person of color, you had to look a long way to find those people or they were in very stereotypical roles, okay? The female DJs were always told to sound sexy, okay? Uh, we were <laughs> expected to be kind of hippie chicks, you know? And the idea of a female doing top 40 the Republic might fall. I mean, it just might be horrible, okay? So in a world like that, I wasn't terribly surprised as a music director that when I went to concert, when I went to a concert, by and large, the guys were the ones that went because they were the ones that had the better jobs and could afford the tickets. Even back then, music was expensive to go to. But as society changes, I start seeing more women and even more people of color at rock concerts. It's not that they didn't want to go. Maybe they just didn't feel like the space was a welcoming space before that. And the 70s are where that starts changing. Yeah, I think, you know, it's true. There are all these movements in the 70s. Of course, one of them on topic here is the women's liberation movement. And um, aside from that, if you were, it must have been extremely difficult to be a true fan of a band without, as a woman, without being objectified and being labeled as a groupie. That's a whole other uh, uh, obstacle for any honest and true fan regardless of gender, to have to overcome, right? I mean, so that might, that could have also been a, a, a real issue with this male-dominated audience and, of course, women being continuously objectified in those very early days or ongoing. 
Yeah, and, Annie, you know, I don't know if you ran into this, but did you run into people assuming that you were the girlfriend of somebody with the band or the, you know, because I ran into this for people that didn't know that I discovered the band, okay? And yeah. they just like, were like, oh, you know, are you dating? No, I like the band. Have, did you run into that? Did either of you run into that? I didn't run into that, but the idea of, I think, the idea of fandom, I think, is really interesting because I think, you know, especially if a woman is a fan of an artist, you know, there's, it's a different connotation than generally if a, a man is a fan of an artist. You know, women and, and female, and you see this with teenage girls especially, being a fan of something is kind of seen as a pejorative, is something that's kind of seen as a negative. Um, you know, so if you're, you know, okay, oh, I'm a fan of Rush. Oh, really? Does your boyfriend like Rush? Or, you know, oh, you know, I like this, yeah. you know, you like this band. Oh, you must think they're cute. You know, you can't necessarily, if you're like, no, I really appreciate their music yeah. or their lyrics, it's not taken as seriously. And that, that honestly very much persists today yeah. in, in certain circles. Oh, well, uh, so Donna. I was, oh, yeah. I was interviewed by Man Cow, the mm -hmm. uh, shock oh, jock. Mm -hmm. And he ended up cutting the interview short, not because of anything I did, but of, because of something I didn't do. Um, Mancal, of course, does this whole shock jock thing. And I know it's a shtick. I'm sure in real life he's, you know, good to his mother and blah, blah, blah. But on the air, he's very cutting edge, very edgy, the whole thing. And the first thing he asks me is like, how many of the members of Rush did you have sex with? And I'm like, what? Oh. Uh, I was like the big sister. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I was like speechless. I'm like, none of them. We don't, we're friends. I mean, I know they're families. And he just couldn't wrap his head around the fact that I never had sex with the band. When, when, when was that? When did that happen? Two years ago. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't even know he was still around. <laughs> Uh, oh my goodness. I mean, imagine my surprise because I get asked to oh do my interviews. Goodness. I'm sure Annie, I'm sure Eddie, uh, you know, we get asked to do interviews because we yeah. know a lot of people or we've been in conferences or we've written articles or blah, blah, blah. So when he reached out, I figured it was just going to be like, oh, you know, interview, whatever. People ask me like, you know, where were you the first time you did whatever? That's so, fine. So know. So Donna, let me ask you, if, if in your role, uh, when you first discovered Rush at the radio station, what if you, what if it was a man in your role? Would Rush have been discovered? I'd like to believe they would have, but I'm going to say something that some people are going to get very offended with and okay, fine. Please. Let's well, I just want to, but, but wait, wait a minute. But, but this but is, no, what, I'm very okay. serious. Okay, good. I think if it had been a guy that discovered Rush. I don't know if there would have developed the kind of friendship where we became close friends with their family members, where I knew their kids, you know, this and that. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, I've never been very good friends with Rush's kids. I know several of them, but in terms of family members, yeah, I'm friendly with Getty's sister. I speak with Neil's best friend, Craig, pretty often. I'm not sure that level of extended family and extended friendship. I'm still friends with the members of the management. I still talk to Peggy. I don't know because in our culture back then, male friendships were still kind of looked down on. It was like, yeah, you had drinking buddies, damn it. You went to the football game, damn it. But in terms of just being friends, having a cup of coffee, talking about family and relationships, oh, that was girly. And I'm not sure it's as girly today, but yeah, back then, I think the band would still have gotten discovered because a great band is always going to get discovered. But I don't know if the four decades of friendship would have ensued. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Uh, Annie, I know you're on a tight deadline. Any lasting comments on this topic uh, relating to you know, in a, gen in a general way, just women at concerts in modern day where we can't go to too many concerts any anymore. No. Uh, unfortunately, I'm like, I'm like jonesing. <laughs> what is, well, it, 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 well, let me ask this. What has changed in your view? Um, 
maybe since that article, perhaps, or just over a decade or so? You know what I think has changed is I think a lot more, I, you know, I, I think back a few years ago, I saw Queen with Adam Lambert. And I think the thing that struck me and was really gratifying to me is that how many different generations were at the show. I mean, we had, you know, old school Queen fans. You had people who probably discovered them in the 90s because of Wayne's World. And you had kids and because who might have discovered via Adam Lambert. May, I, so may I interject? Yes. I brought my 10-year-old to see Queen with Adam Lambert three years ago. And he was, he was not the only kid there by a long shot. No. And I saw exactly what you saw, where it was like, you know, the whole mosaic of humanity was there. Uh, but that, please go on, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm but no, I mean, that, that's exactly it. I, I see a lot more, I think, teenage, you know, gir teenage girls and younger too, who are into music and going to shows because their parents don't necessarily have the, you know, biases maybe that, you know, uh, some, not necessarily our parents, but, you know, older generations of parents might. It's like, of course, sure, I'm going to take my kids there. And, you know, and I think the internet too has just been a, a, such a boon for kids as well. I mean, you see, you know, all kids, I, I see girls, you know, doing ukulele covers of, you know, different bands on YouTube, you know, classic rock, I think has become a lot more, uh, you know, because of the internet has become a lot more open for women and girls. You know, I think a lot of the biases against the bands and, you know, what they kind of stood for then have really fallen away. I mean, just look, I mean, look at Journey as well. You know, when you yeah. look at, I mean, they're huge, they're probably bigger than ever now, just because there's so many you know, kids that are into them. Yeah. But with Rush too, I think the coolest thing I've seen, I was thinking about it you know, before this call is that I've seen so many covers pop up. I just got an email yesterday that someone did a cover. And of course, Primus is doing, you know, their tour hopefully next year. But, you know, like Mary Timoney did this amazing cover of Subdivisions and she's mm -hmm. this fantastic guitarist. Mm -hmm. Another publicist friend of mine said, you know, oh, I have some, you know, women doing, working on something with Rush. You know, that the music is really filtering out in different ways and musicians and it, there's no stigma. Mm -hmm. I feel like the stigma has really fallen away. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. I think Donna, you know, probably, you know, I think the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction, and I think back so much to that Rush, mm -hmm. Rush, uh, you know, finally the establishment thought Rush was cool, but everyone else already knew that. But I think since then, people have really started to look at the band a little differently. Yeah. Like, also, it seems as a music with, with, with not just with social media, but the, the, the transmission of and the accessibility of digital media has yeah. allowed bands to reach global proportions. And once that occurs, then you just have everybody into it. I mean, I look at Journey now as a global, as an international band. I mean, they have a, they have a, 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 a Filipino mm -hmm. singer, right? So is he Filipino? I forget. Uh, um, I believe so, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I just think that in, you know, with Rush, to me, they're global. You know, Iron Maiden is f global, you know, um, international. Uh, so that changes a lot too because i think there's more there's more there's an inclusiveness when a band there's more of an inclusiveness when a band is of global proportion so and, i don't know maybe yeah, more to the be discovered thing that the internet has done and it's fashionable to trash all the things the internet has done to mess things up sure but let's also be honest the internet has allowed people to let their creativity shine i get sent stuff all the time from people who are never necessarily going to go out and be professional musicians, but they were touched. Like, for example, you wrote this beautiful piece, Annie, when Neil passed away, and thank you for quoting me. I appreciated it. But even if you hadn't, there were millions of people who were touched by that. I still get videos being sent to me from, you know, daughters and brothers and cousins and just people who loved the band and just want you to hear how the band inspired them and here's their tribute. And they're never going to let the tribute go up, you know, for, for sale anywhere. They're just doing it because this touched me and I want to just show you what this means. Have, have you noticed that as well, guys? Have you noticed that people just want to pay tribute to Rush? It's, it's, it's why we're doing this show to be honest with you it's i mean really a lot of it when we were for, when john and i were first talking about it we felt like we had not really had an opportunity to grieve when neil passed and yes the band had stopped already but you know when neil passed that really that was it and we there just there wasn't really an outlet 
for us, you know, I, I wrote uh, a couple of pieces when Neil passed also, because I do news writing sometimes, um, but it, it wasn't the same. Um, we want to have this sort of ongoing relationship with the music and with other people who feel the same way that we do. Because it's, it's not just about certain notes against certain chords getting played or something like that. This has meaning for us. And it's uh, like a family. This is why Eddie, yeah. with, with yeah. RushCon and everything like yeah. that, people wanted to get together with others yes. who were like them and mm -hmm. who shared their interest, but who also understood the importance of Rush. And for people watching this and going, you know, the importance of Rush, they were a rock band. Rush were always more than just a rock band. They were always like this, the leaders of this extended family. And I got that right from day one. I knew when I first heard Working Man that these guys were going to resonate with people. Did I know they would keep resonating for 45 years? No, nobody can predict that, okay? We're a throwaway industry. The band that everybody loved last year, it's like, who even thinks about them this year? You can count on the fingers of one hand the number of bands that have been able to reinvent themselves for new generations and not be a parody of themselves. I mean, bands who have a unique focus in each new generation. But Rush inspired conventions. They inspired conferences. They inspired books. They inspired articles. And even throughout all that, friendships are being formed, and those friendships have lasted generations. I mean, Annie, I never would have met you if it weren't for Rush. Eddie, I never would have met you if yeah. it weren't for Rush. John, I might have run into you sooner or later because yeah, you're a couple of locals in the academic world like I am. Yeah. I mean, Dan, I don't know if I would have, but I'm very serious. I mean, the people that I have met because of Rush, it changed my life. Speak on that topic there. We have Kelly D, superfan Kelly D, waiting patiently. And I just wanted to, I didn't want to keep her waiting so long, but I'm going to bring her in. Uh, Annie, you still good? You want to hang out or are you going to? I have, I, I just wanted to say one thing and then I'm Go going to it. pop off because totally. I think, you know, what uh, the, the idea of community, um, because I, I think that's so important. I think, and I've always, I've always loved RushCon and I yes. think I love, I love what everyone does. I love what you guys do. Um, I was at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame last year when Getty and Alex did their talk for Getty's book and mm -hmm. just, and I know you guys were there too. And it was just, uh, and you can probably talk a little about more, but the, it was such an amazing day. It was just like everyone, you know, because obviously Rush fans came from all over, you know, people dressed up, people wore shirts, but it was such, a, you know, and it, it felt like being, you know, at a show. And even though, you know, they didn't perform, they just, they talked, but there was such that community it was so wonderful. And, you know, I still think back just about how almost overwhelming it was just because everyone, you know, f had a chance to gather and hang out and, and, and you know, and tell the band thank you and it was it was such a wonderful day and I, I just think about that but I think what Donna was speaking to is just you know the extension the rush universe in a sense yes. I think it really really distinguishes the band and I think really you know makes it special so Annie where can we find where can folks find more about what you do um, I generally Twitter. Um, I'm okay. at just at Annie Zaleski, and um, I've been I haven't been posting as much because I've been um, I've been hunkered down researching and writing. But uh, okay. generally, I post all my stuff there too. Cool. Thank you so and much for admit, joining us. I will admit something I never admit to anyone, but okay. I'll admit uh -oh. it. To you. I always thought Simon Lebon was cute. <laughs> I, I, I admit it. I sorry, and I must tell you that Hungry Like the Wolf classic yeah they were a great radio band. Yeah. jam who doesn't I don't love duran duran ever like duran duran to this day hungry like the wolf great music video great song what can i say please i mean i just remember him at the edge of that boat that yacht you know with his hair flowing <laughs> oh back my God. who didn't want to be that dude you know like come on also changed something about rock and roll in terms of like hungry like the wolf had like four different cuts for radio. They had a short version, a medium short, a long version, and then what they called the night version. 
And the night version was a discified kind of version with a really heavy beat. And when you were in your car, you're just bopping along to this. I'm serious. I still remember it. I still have that version. Incredible. Nice. Awesome. And Andy, thank you so much. It was a real honor. No, this was yeah, really fun. You. This was really yeah. great. I'm, I'm excited to see the rest of it when it goes up. Bye, Andy. Awesome. Thank you for thank you. Time, and good, good luck with good luck thank hitting you. your deadline. Thank Bye. You. So, Eddie, t Rush Con is a women organized thing. It's a it's a nonprofit thing that was organized mm -hmm. by women, right? Yes. So, talk about the impetus of that and yes. how Rush Con forms and what a sort of effects that has had and how that how the fact that women it's a women organized uh, uh, function uh, or event and how that may have affected the, the inclusiveness of women into uh, the fandom of rush. Is there some connection there? Or do you see more women at rush? I haven't been to a rush con. It's always been a, a bucket list for me. I, I wish I had, uh, mm -hmm. especially now. So can you talk about that? Yeah, well, it, we started, we were um, in the early nineties, I got onto the internet. And of course, the first thing I did was look up rush. You know, like, like even before the World Wide Web, it was, was a gopher and some of those early mailing lists, early uh, National Midnight Star, where I first met Donna. Um, and so the, the communities were building. And it was mostly men at the time, but there were, we women were there, maybe sneaky Heidi, um, who we were. Um, but then some of the, the, ver the various mailing lists and things were crashing around us. So we just started, everybody's like going, I don't wanna lose tra track of you, I don't wanna lose track of you. And everybody just kept saying, man, we should go to Toronto. There's all these cool things we could do up there. And um, a friend of mine does a, um, a convention called Anglicon back in Seattle, which is British media. So celebrating uh, British television and movies. And I said, well, I can do that. I don't know what I'm doing, but I can do that. So I made the call and that's how we started. And um, of course, I, I do want to say there were some men in the first year or two say, and they were wonderful guys. I'm still very close friends with them. Um, but you know, their lives uh, went other directions. They got busy with some other things and it became this core of, of five women which I do think was that actually made it more welcoming for women to come to RushCon. Because the idea is uh, getting together, ha having fun, celebrating Rush. It's not about, oh, look how cute they are. Now, we may talk about how cute they are. But the big thing is it's about the music. Okay. And we can, I can, I have sat and spent an evening chatting with uh, a, a wonderful woman from Leeds. We spent the whole night just talking Rush. Like, the influences and the bands and the concerts and and all of those things that and I had this wonderful connection with somebody that I would never have met except for Rush um, and then as Kelly you know knows as, as somebody who really traveled on the tours you get to know so many people and it becomes this ro rolling party Bingo. because of RushCon the concert became more than just a concert it became an event became a thing to do. It encouraged people to come out, get out of their shells, get out of the basements, get out of the, the, the dark rooms playing computer games or whatever stereotype you want to say about us. Um, and, you know, I've built, I've built friends. I've been friends with decades that I'm still friends with. We get together even now. We're starting to do a couple of virtual events. And it really is about the fans, about coming together. I think women organizing it made it more welcome and opening for women, I think if it was all men run, I might, even I might feel a little intimidated about going. Um, I think we bring a, a kind of a different, a different spirit. I think we bring a different spirit to it. What you're saying about creating an opening is so true because I've been around, obviously, being in a male-dominated industry for many years. Uh, I've been around mostly men in, in broadcasting for years. But when you go to a Rush event, there was always this tolerance. And I don't mean tolerance like, oh, putting up with. I'm talking like, however you are, whatever you are, whatever your beliefs, uh, are you a vegan? Do you eat meat? Are you a righty? Are you a lefty? Are you? It, 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 nobody cared. What was really important was, are you a fan? And if you were a fan, you were welcome. You're a member of the Rush family. Kelly and I have talked about this on a multitude of occasions. It is well known that I don't smoke, I don't drink, and I don't do drugs. 
I have never had a problem at any rush event with people pressuring me or mocking me or anything. I've sure had that at other events with other bands. Oh, yes, I have. Mm-hmm. But at a rush event, because it comes from the top. The guys in the band are tolerant. The guys in the band are family men. So they have the space. If you want to party, God bless you. Party. You don't want to party, God bless you. Don't party. But the, all yep. they care about is, do you appreciate the music? And I, I know, Kelly, have you had that experience as well? In terms of uh, tolerance and, yeah. and accept, yeah, yeah, definitely the, the inclusivity of the events that we had over the, the Rush touring years and then the, the final Rush Con in 2016, it was just a big love fest. And that's where I was really like, even though I felt kind of intimidated, um, my first Rush Con, which was the like the satellite event in uh, Las Vegas in, in 2011, mm-hmm. um, I kind of went in there with only like a few friends and I left with dozens more. So yeah, it was, it was wonderful to like have that core love of this band that already was sort of on the, the outskirts of society and mainstream pop culture to um, be like, yeah, you, you like this weird thing too. So we could probably, we probably have more common ground than we think. So we had, we had Martin Popoff on the show a few weeks back. Who's, fairly well-known author of uh, all things rock and roll and heavy metal. He's the go-to guy. You'll see him on a lot of documentaries. Um, he's fairly knowledgeable. Now he, when we mentioned that we, you know, it's about when we talked about future shows, we mentioned this show and he, or, or in passing, he might've mentioned uh, women at rush shows, but referred to them as Getty corns. Have you ever heard that before? Getty corns? Mm-hmm. Well, well, for me, uh, it's it's that idea that uh, women fans are so rare. It's like a unicorn, and if mm-hmm. you see one, it's like, oh, oh my gosh, oh, oh you know, and it, it, you know, you can take it as an insult. I don't. I find it just kind of amusing because yeah. it's so untrue. Yeah, right. <laughs> and because the fans, we're here, we're here, and even though I didn't right. come into the band until Presto, so many of my friends, my women Rush fan friends started in the 70s and early 80s and found them on their own and have been going to shows for decades. We've been here. Yeah. You just didn't see us, you know. <laughs> the other thing, too, is whether it's true or not, okay, and I can't speak to it because I started off sort of like a big sister to the band and then ultimately became friends, but I've spoken to female fans who have said to me that they think Getty is cute. And that was very mystifying to Getty. He was like, <laughs> it's the hair, man, you know, it's the hair. And it's everything. If you want to yeah. talk about, and, and I have talked about like how untouched by celebrity and fame these guys are. But yeah, I have had female Rush fans reach out to me on social media like, oh my God, Getty's so cute. But they also <laughs> love the music. It's not the, the mm-hmm. whole thing that you talked about with the stereotype of like, oh my God, they just like them because they're adorable or whatever. Oh. I mean, yeah, sure. I thought Simon <laughs> LeBon of Duran Duran was adorable. Yes, I did. <laughs> not seen anybody and I sure would have seen him. Yes, I did. <laughs> but on the other hand, you hear that, Simon? Simon, if you're out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been married for many years and so have I. And no, I wouldn't have seen him, my husband. Thank you very much. But my point is, <laughs> like in the rock and roll fantasy, it's like, boy, you know, would I like to meet that person? But on the other hand, I liked their music. And I mean, yeah, they were kind of top 40 and poppy Duran Duran, but so what? You know, I'm a top 40 (laughs) DJ. I played what the hits were. But when it came to Rush, I found even though they weren't a top 40 band, people that were fans treated them almost like they were. They had certain songs that they really adored. And oh my God, if I could just meet Getty and tell him how much X song means to me, or I'd really like to meet Neil. And whenever I hear the song, I'm air drumming along. And I, it's part of the experience. Well, it's, it's kind um, of like, it's like Beatlemania in a way, where yeah. it's, it's this one very specific type of fandom that you will never see with anyone else. This is specific to them. 
Uh, and I think, you know, what you were saying about Duran Duran, but, you know, the appeal is why I was in high school when Duran Duran were popular. And it was, you could tell it was, they just had a very wide appeal. There was a lot going for them on multiple levels. It was no mystery to me why they would get popular. Rush, I felt, got popular almost in spite of themselves because they were, <laughs> they were not courting that at all. They had no interest that I could tell. Um, they did not seem particularly obsessed to me about chart placement or anything like that. They just did what they did. And I, if, if I may be so bold, uh, I think any women fans of Rush who find themselves attracted to the band members uh, are, they're responding, I think, to a, like an emotional quality that they give off and a yeah. personal quality that they give off. Absolutely. I mean, well, not, to, exactly. not to say that they're not beautiful, well, they're Renaissance. Men, they're Renaissance know. men, yeah. right? I mean, this is there's, the thing. You get you it's, get it's the weird. sense that yeah, I mean, you get the sense that there's a lot to them and that they have a lot to say and right. that they're interesting and that yes. sort of thing. It's my my that's, guess. That's what people tell me. It's not so much like oh, I'd like to get next to Getty. It's yeah. more along the lines of I'd really like to thank him. I'd really <laughs> like to yes. tell him that X song meant a lot to me right. or that because of him I started doing whatever. I mean. Same with me. Oh, and same yes. With Alex. Yes. The, 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 it, because it, 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 and just to kind of break this down into something very simple is like talent is sexy or talent is attractive and integrity is attractive right. and strength and intelligence. Mm -hmm. right. You talked about integrity and honesty and the fact that what Rush are as people is what no. shines through in their music. Right. And yeah. I, Kelly, for example, is an artist. She's such a talented person. And I'm not saying that because she's a friend of mine. I'm saying that because, like, it happens to be true. And I've seen so many talented artists, sculptors, musicians, singers, writers who were inspired by their love of Rush. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that was my next question is how has Rush it's already established that you're a Rush fan, a fan of their music, the individuals. Now, how has Rush uh, impacted your lives in ways that have uh, created these peripheral things, like with you, Kelly, and your painting? Has Rush inspired you so much to 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 get you to get by paint and learn how to paint? What, what What's the deal with that? Well, frankly, like, if I had never become a Rush fan, I don't even know what kind of life I would be leading. They've impacted me that much. It's to the point where like they have their ethos and how they have become themselves has been so inspirational to me that you know they helped me um, switch colleges from one that wasn't a, a good fit to one that was, one that uh, they directed my career. Um, they helped me uh yeah to be where i am now which is being a starving artist <laughs> but i'm actually thanks, Rush. I, yeah <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot but really i wouldn't i wouldn't have it any other way because i'm i'm not the t i'm not the type of person to you know be in a cubicle for the rest of my days i'm just not and rush's music and and their personalities helped me see who I am. So yeah, I'm ex yeah, extremely inspired by not only um, their aesthetic, <laughs> like, in, oh, over here. Ah, shit. I can't do. <laughs> there we go. Um, this is, <laughs> this is a painting of um, uh, like hemispheres era rush. So they have, you know, the long flowing hair. So that's going to become a cool painting. Um, and also the, the album art by Hugh Syme. It's Syme, right? Not Syme. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah they, that artwork has been so um, enrapturing for me for decades that mm -hmm. I've wanted to recreate it, and people have like wanted me to recreate it often in, in miniature. So, um, yeah, it's really amazing that one band <laughs> and their legacy can really inspire so many people in so many different ways, and least of all me. Yeah. I That's wouldn't wonderful. be on this call. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, I mean, seriously, nobody out there would give a rat's patootie 
about anything I had to say. Now, that's sad in many ways, because I'd like to believe I've got a lot that's interesting. And I probably would have a small group of people that know my work or that heard me on the air or whatever. There's a million DJs out there. You've forgotten most of them. Maybe you grew up listening to this one, but you haven't thought about them in years. But thanks to my discovering rush, I ended up with friends I never would have had otherwise, knowing people I never would have met otherwise, and becoming part of an adventure that I never expected. Now, agreed, there are people that, like I said, I might have run into them sooner or later anyhow, but it accelerated the process. It gave mm -hmm. me a, an extended family that, I never would have had, and I don't delude myself for one minute. Part of it is like my all-around wonderfulness. Nah, mm -hmm. none of it is my all-around wonderfulness. And oh, hush, it is. <laughs> Eddie, you know, Eddie, how about you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> the woods are full of people who have all-around wonderfulness. But I'm saying that what distinguished me for a lot of people was my proximity to Rush. And at first, that's probably what drew people to me. It's like, oh, wow, can you get me backstage? You know, and when they found out that, no, I couldn't. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them went off in a half or a minute and a half, but others just kind of <laughs> stuck around and we became friends and we're friends even unto this day. And every single person on here is somebody that I probably wouldn't have met if it weren't for Rush. Eddie, how about you? How has Rush impacted your life, Eddie? Uh, uh, well, Rush, well, with RushCon, obviously, but just in well, general. RushCon. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, it's it's been a part of my um, marriage, my entire almost thirty years to married to a Rush fan. Um, he kind of, I had this budding Rush fandom growing, and then he took me to my first concert, Presto, in Denver at uh, Fiddler's Green, and you know. It, it's just been such a part of our marriage and something joyful that we can share together. That's something that we have together. It's helped decorate my house because I have rush art all over our house. Um, but just beyond, beyond those simple things, things that, you know, it's like, Oh, Neil's reading this book and well, maybe I'll go check it out. Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance. I never would have read that. Even though if, if I hadn't said, Oh, he's reading that maybe that's a good book. And that was a life changing book for me. I've met people from, around the world, which for me, it's expanded my view. It, I care, like if something bad or something good happens in another country, I might know somebody from there that I've met through RushCon and, and met through, through Rush concerts. And, and I care, it, I think it's, it's really expanded, made me that citizen of the world. That's, that's really how I felt. Mm -hmm. And then getting out and going, I never would have gone on any other, I've, not for any other band have I traveled. Well, now I've been to a lot of different fun cities. I've met a lot of people. So for me, it's expanded my world. And I, I, I just, it would, my world would be so much smaller without Rush. I think we really have to give credit to the lyrics, which I feel does, never gets enough attention. Uh, I have to believe right. that, pe you know, people all of you know, in South America, Europe, Japan, whatever, they're, that's part of it. That's, that's, that's what raises their game a little bit and makes it easier to connect with them. So I'm not, I'm not surprised that you find yourself more able to connect with other people because you have the, you know, you have this thing in common and uh, mm -hmm. you almost, you almost don't even really need to spell it out for them. They know, they just know. And uh, you know, John and I uh, right. snipped each other out at a Woodstock event and just started talking rush. You just know. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why we're all here. This is true. So, Eddie, what is the future of RushCon? I mean, I, uh, with COVID-19, things have affected the live event industry greatly. Uh, but yes. beyond, beyond that, with Neil's passing, the, mm -hmm. RushCon continues, right? It lives on or what? RushCon, it's definitely living in our hearts. We, um, before, you know, in the before times, as we like to say, uh, we were thinking maybe something oh, next God. year. But now we need to wait and make sure that everyone's safe. And then once the pandemic is through and we're, be, because we do want to uh, 
reach out to everybody, no matter where they are in the country or the world. And we want it to be safe for them to come and join us. We do want to do a future event, but we just have to wait till it's safe for everyone to get together. And until then, uh, we want to just continue virtual events because, oh boy, you know, um, and, and I'm a kind of a ranty person these days, just the stress from everything. I get all grr, but last week we did that 40th anniversary listening party. It was the, the fifth anniversary, the R40 fifth anniversary Los Angeles listening party show <laughs> or whatever we want to call it. Um, we did a listening party and just spent a few hours chatting and, and doing a Zoom meeting and everybody's like showing their, their, their oh, what shirt are you wearing? Oh, where, where's your cup? Okay, what do you got? You know, and just connecting. I, I needed that. I was practically in tears when it was, when it was over just because I was connecting with people that I love, people I care about, new people I just was just meeting for the first time. And we're all still there. I mean, that's, it's been five or four years since we've all gotten together in person, but it hasn't stopped. People are still getting together for rush camp, people getting together in little local gatherings. People want to get together and uh, remember Neil. And so, the love is still there. We're really start. We, we're really feeling that momentum, but we just need to wait till it's safe. Right. Yeah. And where can folks find out more about RushCon and its legacy? Okay. The great, the best thing to do is to sign up for our email list. If you go to rushcon.org, so rushcon.org, you can sign up for the email list. We're also there's a Facebook page uh, that and. Um, so through the Facebook page, we do things like we do a rush con a secret Santa. We've done that for a couple of years. That's been a big hit. Um, and that's, that's the best way. And, you know, you can go and we're on, you know, Instagram and Twitter and all the, all the social media things too, but Ooh. yeah, sign up for the email list. That's the best way we can keep and keep you up on what's going on. Cool. Uh, Kelly, what about you and your art? Are you selling your art or where can people see your art? Yep. Um, let's see if this works. Um, you can find it on Facebook at um, facebook.com slash art by Kelly D. Uh, I'm also on Instagram at, at vital visions art. And you can see my uh, rush concert photography at, at show shots by Kelly D. Um, yeah. Most of my stuff is commissioned. I do uh, scenery. I do landscapes. Um, people are interested. I'd be happy to um, uh, talk with them about getting paintings done. And really uh, that's, that's been my outlet in these wild times is making art for people. And that's been really therapeutic. That's yeah. awesome. That's awesome. And about you, Donna, where can folks find out about you? Uh, in, in more places than I can imagine. Uh, <laughs> well, um, I, you can Google me for heaven's sake. Um, but um, I blog, I, uh, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I write articles, I write chapters for books, I, you know, I just basically try to stay busy. And I'm, I'm very serious. If people just kind of Google me. They will, mm -hmm. you know, see some of the videos I've done recently. I've done, been on a couple of webcasts, a couple of podcasts. I was on yours a couple of weeks ago, which was a big privilege. And I'm so glad your show is doing well. And um, I, I, I just basically, in times like this, the best thing you can do is keep busy. Yeah. And I find writing to be very cathartic. Um, I write for the Society for American mm. Baseball Research, so I'm always putting up new bios in their bio sketches. And I'm always trying to do new articles about whatever topic somebody wants me to research. I'm still teaching classes. I mean, you know, for somebody 73, I think I'm doing all right. What do you think? You know? I think you're doing awesome. This show uh, is meant to, uh, to, 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 to dismantle the, the myths that women were not Rush fans of Rush and were never at any shows. In fact, we've, we've, we've fixed that issue. Women have always been at Rush shows. And in fact, we have uh, a, a woman that discovered Rush and we have a, a, a women-led organization that runs the biggest Rush convention on the planet. We have super fans that paint paintings of Rush and that, uh, uh, that are inspired in their daily lives by this magnificent band. So this is the show of all shows that kind of breaks all of those myths and 
uh, sets us on a new path uh, on a new idea about Russia and how Russia has affected uh, gender, popular culture, um, and uh, all those things that we love about them and how they make us feel special. Donna, you want to elaborate on that? Don't forget Annie Z. Cause, I mean, oh, and Annie Z, of course, yes. You've got rock critics yes, who write rock critics, articles right. for major publications. Yep. Yep. I mean, well, extra yeah. kudos for her, for Annie, for wearing a Power Windows shirt. Yes. Uh, my, segue, my segue into the band, of course. Uh, and a lot of people don't like Power Windows, but I happen to love Power Windows and I don't care. Oh, it's a great yeah. album. It is a great Power album. Power Windows yeah. is great. Yeah, Excuse well. Me. Yeah. Excuse me. Hey, some people don't like oh, 80s, 80s Rush. I'm thinking it right now. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. You gotta, I know. You gotta give I it up for oh, 80s Rush. That's a really, that's really I'm cool. Not say, I'm not saying this because I'm a fan, okay? Because yes. <laughs> I'm saying this like a former DJ. Yes. I have never heard any Rush album that I couldn't at least find a couple of songs I really liked. What's your favorite oh, album? Agree. Agree. Everybody's got some album they like better than some other album. Okay? That's fine. But when people say, oh, I can't stand blah, 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 you know, go back and re-listen and you might find that there's one or two cuts on there that still can speak to you, maybe even in a way you didn't expect. What's your favorite Russia album, Donna? Do you have one? Um, I can never answer that question because for me, that's like asking a mom, who's your favorite kid? Mm -hmm. Okay, It's like... But he's, you, no, but you could think of it a little differently as what's the album you find yourself going back to the most often when you decide, I want to listen to Rush. Is there one album that you just find more than any other that's the one that tends to get played the most? Yeah, probably moving pictures or grace under pressure. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But even there, I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, mm. I can name you something on every album because yeah. it really depends on the mood I'm in. I don't know if you've ever found that. Yeah. I mean, there's times I'll just be sitting and going through YouTube videos. It's like, God, I haven't heard time stand still in ages. Got to hear that. You know, that mm. there's other times when it's just like, Oh, limelight. Yeah, I know. Radio played it to death. But it's such a great song. Okay? Yes. And you got the fan It's, a, it's overplayed for a reason. Yeah. You've got the fan uh, I, I, <laughs> thing with Spirit of Radio, which brought back a whole new bunch yeah. of people that hadn't thought about Spirit of Radio for ages. That sort of thing. But uh, seriously, I don't really right. have a favorite. I always look at it like these are my friends. It's been a privilege to know them for more than four decades and to be a part of their lives in some small way. Every album is their communication to the fans and I salute them for constantly being relevant, for constantly reinventing themselves and for influencing entire new generations. Does that make any sense? It does. And I admire that, but we wouldn't have a show if everybody felt that way. Um, Donna, what was your first, what was your first show that you ever saw Rush play live? Do you remember? Um, when I was in Cleveland, sure. The Allen Theater. Um, the, the one where their manager we were standing up back and the guys were really nervous. And, um, and Vic, who was the co-manager at the time, um, he took my hand and he said, don't worry, Donna, we won't let you down. And Aww. I gotta <laughs> say that over more than four decades, they've never let me down. They are the nice. same good human beings. You know, God rest Neil's yeah. soul. These are family men. These are decent people. And I use decent in the sense of ethical Yep. honorable when you think of rock stars you don't think of like oh ethical honorable and they're good to their families you think of like oh my god people tearing up hotel rooms yeah. that was never them i mean yeah. do they like to party sure but are they more than just like people that like to party yeah i mean as far as i can tell these guys have remained untouched by their success. They never got into, well, don't you know who I am? And they're still just nice human beings. And when Vic said that to me years ago, he meant we'll never do a bad show. But they've never let me down as people either. I yeah, feel yeah. so privileged to be a part of their story 
And I feel so privileged to know you guys and to be on your show. Yeah, so thank this is you. Great. For that. No, thank yeah. you very much. Eddie, first show and favorite album. Can you can you give us that? First show was in uh, 1990 at Fiddler's Green. It was the Presto Tour with Mr. Big opening. Uh, oh, yeah. Favorite albums is Presto and Clockwork Angels. Nice. Right. Yeah, Presto is a great album. I love that album. Um, we had uh, Clockwork Angels. Is, that's uh, an unusual choice. I love it. I thought it was yeah. great. But I, you never hear people specifically singling out that album uh, for whatever reason, because it's it's as good as anything they've ever done. But for some yeah. reason, that one just doesn't get it just doesn't get doesn't get shown the love uh, just, that it deserves. It's Great album. Right. It's incredible that that's their final album too. It's yeah. like yeah. wow, um, um, so strong, I so know. strong. But if you listen to our previous uh, episode, uh, Robert Scoville was the front of house for Presto tour, so he has some interesting little things in there. So check it out. But Kelly, uh, favorite <laughs> album and first tour. Uh, first tour was Snakes and Arrows, and uh, favorite album is a tie between Presto and Counterparts. So a lot of, oh, wow. a lot of Presto nice. love. Yeah. 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 It's really, and it's about the, um, what, what gets me of those two albums is how emotional they are. And it's how, it's how mm. personal the lyrics are for Neil. Um, like specifically Chain Lightning, um, yes. you know, talking about him and his daughter, like just watching the stars. Um like a meteor shower out in out in the Laurentian mountains and um like even even the speed of love which is maybe as close to a like a traditional love song it, it's still so um specifically Neil Peart like it's like love is born of lightning bolts like electromagnetic force that's so like that's so Neil and yeah, yeah it, it really speaks to like the hemispheres part of it all like they're um they really marry the the anima and animus within us all yeah <laughs> so it really it no, really they, that's that. that's very true yeah that's it exa- that's it exactly yeah. and and especially um <laughs> who doesn't love bunnies <laughs> <laughs> well, remember they had the inflatable. They had the inflatable uh, rabbit out of the hats on the uh, yes. on the tour. That was uh, the bands that don't do fun. that anymore. No, there's no big balloons on stage yeah. anymore. We're done with that. Yeah, right? for good reason. <laughs> we can leave bring, that in the past. Bring back the balloons. Uh, yeah. <laughs> any lasting comments as we uh, uh, as we're moving towards the end of the show? Um, I want to thank, first off, I want to thank you all for joining yeah. us. This was a very important episode, and that's what we're trying to do with the show is really kind of dig deep on these topics. And, uh, you know, yes, we're a show that talks about lyrics. We're a show that talks about uh, specific compositions within songs, maybe uh, just one micro analysis on a drum roll for three hours. We can do it. But, um, <laughs> but I think easily, we, easily. Yeah. yeah, but I think we really want to kind of uh, – go in a different direction and get to the fans and see how rush has affected those fans on a personal level. And on that personal level, there's so much that comes out of that, you know, uh, gender, religion, Russian religion is another show we're mm. going to have, uh, which mm. is going to be great. So any lasting comments, folks? Stay safe, stay Russia's alive a, it, and, uh, keep on stay safe, stay alive. You. Uh, one likes to believe in not just the freedom of music, but the power of music, the power of music to change lives. And so many people have had their lives changed by Rush. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk about that. So Dan, that was, that was great. Yeah, the, we went deep. That went really deep. That went really that, deep. That, yeah. that, you know, I, I was a little worried uh that it might be the sort of thing where you know where we would say you know the perception is that there are not a lot of women at rush shows and that they would feel sort of like challenged or uh you know step to or something like that but they didn't they didn't see it as a hostile question uh but i realized they probably deal with that 50 times a day so yeah, that's probably and, why they had good answers. Yeah, and like I said before, I'm, this episode was meant to debunk any myths yeah. about uh, women uh, at Rush or rim, women Rush fans, and uh, I, I suspect they've always been there. Uh, yeah. But um, you know, 
I think uh, there are a lot of political and social things at play that sort of isolated them and kept them away from being considered true Rush fans that we covered in the episode. And, um, uh, I'm, you know, this is the thing with Rush. Uh, they're a global band. It's an inclusive band. And that is, that's, that bubble has been burst. Here we are. Yeah. Uh, so that's great. Well, um, we uh, will continue on with our episodes. I want to thank every Rush fan that has listened in uh, to episode four, The Women of Rush. Um, and, um, you know, this is the sort of thing we try to cover in our uh, podcast, uh, deep dive into uh, these sorts of um, kind of unique topics uh, and how the band has affected uh, uh, society, uh, whether it's social, political, cultural, whatever. Uh, and if you, have any, if you have any ideas for Rush episodes, something like you'd like to hear, uh, something you'd like us to cover, please send us an email at twoguystalkingrush at gmail.com. And uh, this is John Kane, the delightful the always ever delightful Dan Bucks fan. And we want to thank you for joining us today on two guys and four women talking rush rush rules. Guys are talking, rush two, 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 two guys, two guys are talking, rush two, two guys are talking, rush two, two guys, two guys are talking, rush, 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 two guys. Live music inspires millions around the world, but the concerts we all enjoy wouldn't be possible without the countless crew members working behind the scenes. As COVID-19 puts concerts on pause, we want to extend a helping hand to the touring and venue crews who depend on shows to make a living. Crew Nation was created to do just that. Crew members are the backbone of the live music industry, and we hope you'll join us in supporting them through this temporary intermission until we can once again unite millions around the world through the power of live music. Crew Nation is powered by Music Forward Foundation, a charitable 501c3 organization that will be administering the fund. Live Nation has committed $10 million to Crew Nation, contributing an initial $5 million to the fund, then matching the next $5 million given by artists, fans, and employees dollar for dollar. Please support Crew Nation, at www.livenationentertainment.com slash crewnation.